I guess. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess we will uh, go ahead and officially get started. First off, I want to thank you all for your time and attention coming here on the weekend. Uh, I know there could be other places that you would you know, uh, want to be, but I appreciate you giving me the time to uh, kind of teach you a few things and share with you some things about what I know in terms of project management and overall business analysis and business strategy. All right, so we have a lot to get covered today, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. This is how to manage scope and build what we call a work breakdown structure. These are basic things that businesses expect their project managers to be able to perform. Also, other members of the project team who are working on the project should have this kind of knowledge as well. So what we're going to talk about is going to be how to actually document the scope of the project, how to create a scope statement stating what we're trying to accomplish, and then how to build what we call a work breakdown structure, or WBS. All right, now as we go through the lecture here, we may not get through every slide, but the concepts will be uh, presented to you all so that you have a good understanding and have a good feeling in terms of walking out, being able to know what a scope is, know how to document the scope, and know how to plan how to perform the actions necessary for the scope or really the solution to the project. All right, so a few other things we're going to look at is going to be how to complete and interpret the work in terms of estimates, what has to be done, and we're also going to look at the resource that are needed to complete a project, and then you'll get a chance to actually build a small, uh, simple project schedule. All right, so part of the initial thing that you're going to do if you are asked to work on a project. One, create what's called a project plan. That's going to be all the necessary things that you feel are needed to do in terms of delivering the project. Now, part of what I do whenever I do the training sessions and do uh, consultative workshops is try to get everybody on the same page. So one of the key things that I do is something that we call becoming one voice. Okay? We're going to do this so that we all have a, a clear picture of what a project is for us. Okay? This becoming one voice is very important for your project teams in terms of going after success uh, and being able to communicate properly with your team and your stakeholders. So for our purposes, let's first think of a business. And when I talk to my clients, I always give them the understanding that a business uh, has what we call a project management methodology. In other words, a business is in business to do something, deliver something, perform something. So in doing that, they have to have certain projects that are in place to make that happen. One of the key methodologies is a project management uh, methodology done by PMI, or Project Management Institute. You may also hear PRINCE2. Other organizations may have their own approach, and then if you don't have any kind of methodology, you have what we call the ever-popular GID approach. Are you all familiar with a GID? It's called get it done, okay? In other words, you don't have any particular approach or methodology to it. It's just whatever has to happen, you do what it takes to get it done. You don't want a GID methodology, okay? So you want to try and put something in place that either your organization has or it can follow. So now, the other part to this is every methodology from a project standpoint has a life cycle. So within there, you're trying to identify what are the different life cycles and this is based on the nature and characteristic of the project that you're working on. Every life cycle is broken down into phases. What you see here is a generic phase. Initiation, plan, implementation, and closeout. Every project has this. 
every phase has what we call activities. And all activities can be defined and described in tasks. So this is the lowest level that you're going to have to deal with from a uh, project manager standpoint in delivering a project. Several tasks have to be performed. All right. So now that we kind of have an idea of a project, the next thing that we're going to look at is going to be what are the things that we have to do in order to deliver on the project. So in this initial planning phase, we talk about a few things that have to happen. One, building a core team. Two, understanding and creating a work breakdown structure. Three, coming up with estimates. Four, doing your project schedule. And then five, always something that you're going to do in every phase of your project, conduct risk analysis. All right. Now, other things that you would have to do for the project are going to be develop other management plans and put up these all together as your overall project management plan. But we don't have enough time to go through all of these particular things. But I do want to make sure that you understand these are all part of what's needed in your planning phase. So very quickly, one of the things that we talk about, building a good team, a core team. It may be something that you have access to in terms of your resources. It may be something that you would have to get from other organizations, other business areas. But the key thing that I want you all to understand is you need to get the right people with the right skills and the right knowledge for your core team. All right. So now these are things that are, again, part of their overall project management plan. You need every one of these particular elements in order to deliver a good project. One of the key things is going to be this project management plan will determine some of the things that we had talked about in creating the idea of becoming one voice for our project. What's the life cycle? What level of details are we going to need to get to? What tools and techniques will we need to have? So these are things that you all, as a, a project manager or a member of a project team, would help in developing. All right, so now, the next piece that we really want to understand, one of the keys to the success of projects, is defining the scope. When you hear scope, I want you to think of two things, what's in and what's out. Okay, so one of the things that I want to try and get you all to think about now is we are a part of, uh, we're the consulting, a project management consulting group for a major entertainment company. Okay, you all are project managers for a major entertainment company. And what this entertainment company wants to do is put on a five city tour, concert tour, here in Poland, okay? So just very simply, what would be what's in scope? What would you think? If we say we we're going to put on a five city concert, what will be our end scope? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that will be certain things that are in scope. Well, those are things that we definitely need to plan for. Okay. Which cities we select? Which cities we select? Okay. The dates. When the concerts are going to happen. The dates? Yeah. All of these things are very important things that are part of the plan that we're going to have to put together. But let's think even uh, simpler than that. We talk to the, uh, we talk to the customer. They say they want to do a five-city tour, okay? We start putting our project plans together of the different venues and the, uh, locations and all the other particular things. And then the customer comes back and says, well, actually, we'd want to make it six tours. And we've signed contracts for five. Is that okay? Are you okay with doing six? Project charter, nice word. Okay, yeah, it would depend on all those things. So let's say the project charter and the contract says that we are, we are signed up to deliver five uh, city tour, five venues. 
and then the, cu the customer decides they want to do six. After the contract has been signed, are you going to do it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, we could have a provision in the clause that's uh, in the contract that has a clause that says we can do this and do that. First of all, we have to look at the resources because maybe we are really constrained with the resources and we cannot have a six. And then we should focus on the five rather than trying to build the six. Okay. Again, very good points where you can now have to look at your resources and see whether or not you have enough to do this. Here's the main thing that I want to try and get to you, right? When we initially said we're going to do a contract for five, that was in scope. We think of five venues, that's what we contracted for. That's what we signed up for. When the customer says they want to do a sixth one, that now makes that out of scope. With all the other things that we've talked about, we could look to possibly do it, but we would then have to adjust and change contracts and terms and all these other types of things. So one of the initial points to scope identification and scope management is knowing what you have contracted for, knowing what the customer expectation is or what your stakeholders expectations are in terms of delivering for the project. Now, let's say you're the project manager and you have to identify all the things that are expected in terms of this solution, delivery. You can only choose one. What's going to be your most important thing to focus on? What is in scope or what is out of scope? You can only choose one. What's it going to be? What's in or what's out? Those are Okay. <laughs> Very well stated. But, but I need one. What is out? What is out? Okay, so who says out? Okay. <laughs> A brave soul, right? She, <laughs> she mentioned this, she keeps her hand up. I like that. So I guess if the other option is in, the rest of you <laughs> say in. Okay, I see, I see a few hands saying that, then I see a few heads shaking no. Well, it's one or the other, okay? You're either going to look at what's in or you're going to look at what's out based on what I've presented to you. For the person that said out, why out? Okay. For those who said in, why in? It is easier to define what you have to do. What is in scope? It's easy to define that. At least apparently it's easier. Okay. The things that are out of scope, there could be thousands of these things that are out of scope. So we could list for hours on that. What is not included in our project? Everything should be there. So what's in scope is maybe a smaller group of items. <coughs> otherwise, you will start to think about everything else. And we'd better focus on what we have listed. Because we don't have that list with what we defined. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Very good point, because that's what you're up against as well. You're, you know, 
you may be the only game in town where you can take forever, or there may be competitors, which in this world, and what I'm seeing more of uh, from, a, from a Polish economic and, and Polish business market is, you have more and more competition coming in where you have to do, do that. So you have to be faster about this. So that puts more pressure to consider, what are we going to focus on? Okay. Here's the thing, team. When I ask you these questions, from my perspective, I'll tell you that there is no right or wrong answer. I just want to know what you think. <laughs> However, l let, me, let me say, I won't say that you're wrong. I may say you're just not right. <laughs> All right. So now, to the gentleman's point of it depends. Uh, one of the things that we look at, and when I say we, I talk about my consultants and the consultants that I work with and, and train. I tell them to focus on what is in, because that is what we are contracted to do. That is what we are expected to deliver. But we also have to think about what is out of scope as well. Okay? All right. I just gave you all to, uh, an ultimatum for just one, but in reality, what you really want to do is first get an understanding of what your end scope items are, and then you can begin to think about what may be out of scope items, okay? And it's very important to have this out of scope as well as your end scope items because this is going to generate discussion between you and your stakeholders or most importantly you and your customer from an expectation perspective so that you know what you're going to deliver and they know what you're going to deliver. All right, so now, now that we have an idea of what is both in and we also have to look at what's out, the next thing that we're going to look at is going to be the work breakdown structure. And the work breakdown structure helps us now define what is in and how we're going to do it. Right? So if you want to think about it, all the things that you say are in scope will now have to be defined within the WBS or your work breakdown structure. Now, what is the work breakdown structure? It talks about it in terms of hierarchical structure or grouping of the work that has to be performed and then decompose down to the lowest level, or as we talked about, if you think back to the idea of a project, the activities and the task make up this work breakdown structure. Now, within the WBS, a work breakdown structure, they have different terms uh, and words that are being used. Here are some key terms that are typically used from a WBS perspective that you would want to understand as a project manager. One, the lowest level of the WBS is called the work package. That lowest level you can also think of is the task. What are the small things that have to be done in order for us to deliver? The next level up from the work package is what's called the control account. That determines what all of the lower level packages add up to or have estimates for. And then another package or another term is what's called the planning package. This planning package is typically used where we know something has to happen but we're not certain of all the things that need to go on. So we will capture it and then hold it so that later on we will revisit that and then know how to uh, plan or better plan that particular work item. Right? Also with the planning package it says it's used in what we call rolling wave planning. The rolling wave planning is again we don't know everything. We have a high level idea so we'll build an initial plan and then once we know more then we will further develop that plan. It continues to roll as we get more and more information and get more detailed analysis. All right. So here you see a basic layout of a WBS in terms of a graphical view. All this is saying is at the top level where it calls the project, this is the project level. What this means is once you do everything below this, when you finish, you should have this top level. Okay? Now, 
How many of you are familiar with the work breakdown structure? Some of you have used them. So the rest of you, not so much. Here's the thing. Yes, you are. Okay? And the reason I say that is because you do a work breakdown structure every day. Now, I know some of you are looking like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't know me. You just came here. How are you going to tell me that I do something every day? Relax. What I mean is this. Um, from the moment you woke up, and here's the thing. When you put two feet on the ground, you started doing things from a work breakdown perspective. How do I know that? Because, well, before I just make an assumption, um, how many of you slept here last night? Anybody slept in, sleep in this room last night? No. Okay. So then, when you woke up, you were at your place or a place, and then you had to do whatever you needed to do to get here. So, let's think about this for a second. As a group, we have this is the end state. We want to get to the university. So you all tell me what are some of the things that you had to do from the moment you stepped on the floor. And please keep it clean. I don't want to know about any you know, intimate detail. But what are some of the things that you had to do? Have a coffee. Get, get up from Okay, so that, that's one of the key things. So when I said feet on the ground, you are up. So okay. from that point on, right? And then so have coffee. Um, All right, so I just put get coffee. Get coffee um, wash. Wash. Wash what? Self. Self, okay. Um, go get some buns or some bread in the morning. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> yeah, let me put that because I was going to put buns and I was like, no, nah, I don't want to you know, have too many things. There. All right, so breakfast, wash shelf or shower. What else? I know there's something else that you all did. Mm -hmm. I can see it. Get dressed. Get dressed, yes. Thank you. <laughs> that was in before breakfast. <laughs> all right. So that's before breakfast. Get before dressed. breakfast, you get dressed. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. So here's the thing, team, as far as a work breakdown structure, from the moment you got up, you knew that there were certain things that you had to do, and then you knew that those things involved more than just one activity. In other words, the wash self or the shower took more things than just you know, one activity. The get coffee or fix breakfast took more than one activity to do. So those are the decompositions down to your task level. Okay? So just to make sure everybody is kind of clear, uh, you have a, a pretty good concept of a work breakdown structure? Yeah. Okay. Obviously, there will be much more that we could do, but because of the time, I just want to first plant the seed, give you an idea of what it's about. Now, the next thing that happens is based on the work breakdown structure, as we said, it defines your scope, all right? So what PMI says is anything not identified or defined in the WBS is technically out of scope for your project, all right? So now what we've just done is what's called a graphical view of the work breakdown structure. You can also do what's called an outline or indented view. These are basically the approach that you would see if you're using any kind of project management software, okay? Now, this view can be converted to this view and vice versa. This view, you, if you start off like this, you can have it convert or change to that. Okay, so now we've set the stage uh, for the work breakdown structure. Another piece to the work breakdown structure or another part to your uh, project. First, what the WBS will allow us to do is get estimates. From these estimates, we get three basic types. We get an estimate of time, we get an estimate of cost, 
and we get an estimate of resources, okay? So these are the things that the control account will help us kind of manage. What do I mean? You all know when we do things here, for example, eat breakfast. How long will it take to eat breakfast? Depends on what you're having. Okay. On the average. <laughs> 10 minutes. 20 minutes is what it says. Okay. 20 minutes. It's a huh? big breakfast. It's a big breakfast, right. It's a Saturday, right? Of course. Right? Uh, how long will it take a shower? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. One minute? Oh. <laughs> I'll put 15, right? Unless you're in the military, you're not going to have a one-minute shower. <laughs> or if you're behind on your, <laughs> on your payments, maybe you would have one. Anyway, uh, so then we would have these particular things, but we know a shower is going to be 15 minutes, but we know that there's several other things that are involved in the shower. We know that breakfast is 20, and there's several other things involved in that. So that's where you're getting this lowest level. But now the other part is going to be, um, let's take this breakfast. Okay. Let's say that we don't fix breakfast, we go and have breakfast. Okay. Now there's a cost associated with the breakfast. Now, you could have a cost if you did it yourself as well, but I just want to make the concept clear. So 20 minute breakfast might cost you, I don't know, $15, 15 swat or something. Okay. You just have some. Yeah. and prepare breakfast the day before, save time, and then it's less time in the morning. <laughs> okay. You could do that, right? But there's still going to be some time associated with whatever you're doing for that particular day. If you had to do this uh, for an overall project, whether you did it on Monday or whether you did it on Tuesday, the time associated estimate will still have to be there because the activity still has to happen. But I completely understand your point. And, or you can do like I do, right? I've been here so long, uh, they actually bought me a flat and gave me you know, some food to prepare things with. You can do like I do and fix you know, food on Sunday and then eat it all week. <laughs> but somehow the cereal gets a little soggy when it's in there for four or five days. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's only three days. <laughs> but here's the thing, here's the other part to this uh, work breakdown structure. I heard someone saying things like, hey, you can get dressed before you eat. So here's one of the things that you're doing. When you're identifying the scope of work for your project, then the next thing is going to be, in what order should we do these particular activities and tasks, okay? Now, when we look at this, this is called a network schedule. In other words, this is the time we estimate it would take with all the tasks and proper sequence to do the project itself. Okay? So let's think about this for a second. Um, in what order could we do any of these tasks? And just so you remember, this is get dressed, have breakfast, shower, get coffee. Can you get coffee first? Yep. Yeah, you can, right? Sounds. <laughs> have it brought to you to bed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, That's actually what I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, so you can have coffee brought to you in bed. Those Some of us are lucky. <laughs> um, could you eat breakfast after having coffee? Could you have breakfast before you take a shower? Could you get dressed before you take a shower? Please say no. Okay. So, in other words, team, there's certain order that these things can happen. There's a logical sequence. Some of these can happen before or after, but then other things are built on what we call dependencies. All right. So, we have an understanding of a work breakdown structure. It's all the different tasks that have to be performed in order to deliver the work. I talked a little bit about the network diagram or the network schedule. That's all of those tasks that you've identified in the WBS that now have to be put into a logical sequence. 
Are there any questions on the WBS? Any questions on how to do a network diagram? In order, is there like a cap on how many tasks you can have? No. Okay. If the question is, uh, is there a limit to the number of tasks that you can identify in a work breakdown structure? No. But there's more things to again the work breakdown structure that we're not going to get into that uh, really talk about how to better manage the the number of tasks and how you can uh, set them up so that they can really allocate resources and things to it. This is the key part, though being that this is part of project management, and project management is something that you all experience and deal with every day, knowing this and understanding the value of it makes you more valuable, okay? All right, so now, since there were no questions, what we're gonna do is actually start you off in kind of a group and class discussion or workshop. So here's the first part. We'll do this initial piece as a group, as, a, as an entire class, and then I will have you all kind of work in small groups to kind of finish up. Now, I told you we're project managers working for an entertainment company who wants to put on a five-city concert tour. So let's decide what cities are we going to do this tour in Poland. Okay. <laughs> what is that? Because that's, that's the biggest opportunity to bring, is it the most attractive in terms of the audience? Okay. Number. Okay. Good point. This, this, is, uh, this is one of the things that you want to understand as well uh, when you're trying to identify and put a project together. You have to think about the strategy. Okay. Why is the organization wanting to do this? So this gentleman's point of we want to do it with the biggest so that we can bring more people in only goes toward uh, creating and, and helping to support the business strategy, okay? So let's think about this. Let's put some of the strategies in place. Um, we're going to do this for a five-city tour, and we need to get it done in 30 days. And we have a budget of half a million dollars. Okay. What euros? <laughs> All right. So now, what I just gave you is another piece to every project, which is called a triple constraint. So what we just defined: triple constraints are things for the project that have a time constraint, a budget constraint, and then a scope constraint. All right, so now, knowing more about that, here we are again. Now, we need to decide where are we going to put these tours together. Give me a city. Poznan. Okay, wait, wait, whoa. <laughs> Poznan. Wrocław. 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 Łódź. 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 That's the one in the center. L-O-D-Z, yeah. Katowice in the south. Katowice? Well, it's not on there. Okay. Ktoś okay, mówił so Warszawa? Four. In Silesia, that's where Oświęcim and Kogowice, that's the biggest conurbation of different cities that are next to each other. So he said that that's why Katowice. Okay. It's like a metropolitan area. Okay, so you know, those are the things that we've decided. Okay? Now, what you all need to do is think about what would be the WBS to put the concert on? And it could be in each one of these different cities. So the WBS just for one city or for the yeah, whole tour? Yeah, for one city. So what I want you all to do is, you know, if you can, kind of group together and talk about it for about a minute. What would you think you would have to do in order to put a work breakdown structure together for this first city tour? All right, so think about it. Take just one minute to try and come up with some high-level things. Alf, each team, just give me one thing that they've identified. All right? So basically, when I point to you, all I want is just one particular thing.
that you all identified. I, I looked around and saw that you have a lot of things, but I just want to hear one thing. And then uh, from the other teams, don't, if you can, don't repeat what's already been said. Okay, so think of something else. All right. I'll start here. No, that's the easiest. <laughs> Book the venue. Book the venue. Setting the date. To check the capacity of the venue. Check capacity of the venue. Uh, marketing. marketing. Really? Insurance for the whole event. Insurance for the whole event. Very good. Determining the target audience, right, okay, very good. Now, there will be other things, and I saw you all had a lot of those. Part of what this is, is, is not the responsibility of one individual to make this happen. So with you all as a collection, as a team, you started to come up with ideas of what you needed to do, and then you put that down, and then you start thinking about what are the next steps, okay? All right. So once you all have identified those things, you would actually take more time to drill down into more specifics, okay, to get to that lowest level, the task level. Once you've gotten to the task level, then the next thing would be to put those tasks into a logical sequence. Now, one of the things that I did not hear was, who are we going to promote? What artist? So you all are going to look at all of these different things and then say, oh, we don't know, we don't have anyone to go to it. We assume that that was really said. Shakira. <laughs> yeah, Shakira, all right. Uh, how about back here, in the middle? I'm sure it's cool. Miles Davis, if he was alive. Miles Davis, yes, very good, all right? Michael Jackson, if he was alive. Michael Jackson, too, right. Of course. Ah, okay. So anyway, we have some ideas with these things. These would be part of the things that sometimes it would already be identified. These would be things that we would also have to figure out, okay? And then because of that, we would also have other strategies of where we would go, the venue, the capacity, the market, uh, you know, who we're catering to and all of these other things that become all part of your overall project. Okay, so these are things that, as a team, you all kind of put together. One of the things that I want to mention that we didn't talk a lot about is a WBS dictionary. What this is, is all the things that you identify on your WBS, if it's something that is uh, not clearly identified or clearly understood, then you capture it in your WBS dictionary for others to understand. All right, and this is what that WBS dictionary deals with. So if you're working with software packages, whenever you identify things in the software, you can do what we call uh, you know, specific functions or actions. A double click and then it could bring up a notepad and then you could put the information in and that can serve as your di uh, dictionary. All right, so one of the things that we would have here would be you all creating or putting together your work breakdown structure. Uh, one, one other key thing to kind of think about when we talk about this, we're using the example of a concert. You can do this with anything in relation to your project, okay, or anything in relation to a project. Your work-related activities, if you're planning vacations, family events, you know, anything else, you're doing these same things in a more structured uh, uh, approach, right? So just as an example, um, as Marina mentioned, I work with a lot of companies from small to global in size, and we work on several things, IT-related things, marketing things, uh, product development type things. I also have media clients, multimedia clients. So when I gave the example of the concert tour, working with promoters, I help them build that. I work with um, uh, uh, independent filmmakers or actual Hollywood filmmakers as well, 
right, to put together movies and such. So all of these things are things that you all can do with the knowledge of project management, okay? So here it's just saying that you take the same information that you created on your work breakdown structure and then create it as a network diagram or a network schedule. Another key piece to the overall project and the success of projects is getting good estimates. So part of the challenge that we also have with companies is getting good estimates from the right individuals. Okay? Right, so I told you the WBS helps us get three key estimates, time, cost, and resources. Another thing with that is once we identify those elements, we have to get good estimates or what we call tighter estimates. All right, so let's try this for example. Uh, how long would it take to get from here to the train station? Yeah, the drive. Yeah, right. Five minutes, ten minutes, depending on the day and the time of the day. Okay, here's a very good uh, example of how things are done, right? When I asked the question, I didn't give a lot of information. So one of the first things was to get more detailed information, right? How are you going? And then the other point the gentleman brought up was it depends on several factors. What time of day, what day, and all these other things, right? So where companies, again, get into trouble, where project teams get into trouble is they don't necessarily give all of that information, and people just start making assumptions and giving estimates off of that. Okay, so let's say today, by taxi, right now. How much time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Do we have the taxi right here, or do we have to wait for the taxi? Oh, boy. <laughs> Ten minutes, you said. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Again, other good information you want to ask. But now, here's the other part to this. Where companies, again, have problems is they get one estimate. And what we talk about is a PERT estimate as well as what we call a three-point estimate. So what we're looking at is what is that 10 minutes? Is that the best case, the worst case, or the most likely case? Okay. So these are the things that you want to understand either as the project manager or as a member of the project team. What estimates are we doing and then how are we going to really get and manage those estimates uh, in terms of getting to the best possible estimate. Now this piece down here, the standard deviation, is where if we do a PERT calculation or a program evaluation review technique approach, then whatever numbers we get we can start applying better uh, standard deviations or confidence levels to those. Okay? Some of the things that we do with our clients and because of the work that we've done over and over again, we have calculations that will come up with these things, do some initial estimates, and then be able to really go in and negotiate with the client on how long it should uh, take, how much it should cost, and not just basic numbers that they may have given us. All right. So here again, it's just showing how you can take that information and then start building better uh, schedules for your projects. Then you can also look at what is needed in terms of getting good estimates. So we talked about getting more details. This becomes another key piece. And then it talks about here, basic uh, scheduling tools. The one that we talked about is the network diagram. The others are other scheduling tools that you can use more for communication and uh, information distribution or right, information uh, uh, you know, passing along. All right. So here is a network diagram, basic things. So we had the different tasks that we've identified, uh, find a venue, find dates, look at the capacity do the marketing plan. All of these would be particular tasks that we would identify and then we would determine in what order should we do them that makes the most sense for our project. Right. Now there's also a lot more information that you can get in your network diagrams 
but we don't have the time to really go through all of those things. But the point I want to make to this is you know, when you think about project management and good project management is something that is done from the management science discipline. Okay? So there are several things that you can do that can help increase your chances of success on your projects by following basic principles uh, that are identified in PMI, but then also what are uh, being di distributed or given to you as training. Okay? Okay. I can't tell you how many times I go in and talk to managers and executives about how or why their projects are not being uh, delivered on time or on budget, why they're not as successful. And then we start looking at it and determining, well, it's because you are not following certain project management principles and disciplines. And then further analysis determines that they're not doing this because the teams or the people that they have have not been properly trained. This is something that you all now have a chance to get this understanding and knowledge and then be able to really walk into an organization or a project knowing how to do this stuff. So this piece here talks about a little more information in terms of your network. Again, we don't have the necessary time to go through all of these things, but what would happen here is once you created your network, you would then do these different steps. One is called a forward pass, where you're going through and now determining how long uh, it would take your project to to do certain things and then how much time you would have between tasks before it impacted your overall project. A backward pass is where you are now looking at starting from the end and going back to the, far, the start of your project to determine how much time between tasks you have that could have an impact on the project. Okay? And then you have a path analysis where you're looking at what we determine is uh, the critical path. The critical path is the path that takes the longest in order to complete the entire project. Okay? So think back when I said you have 30 days to get all five uh, venues and concerts done, then you knew that your project had 30 days to complete. Within your network, you would then figure out which ones of those tasks was on that 30-day path and if something were to change, then that would then change or adjust your end date. All right. So here again, you would have forward pass, and it would determine what are the key things. You would have a backward pass to determine the slack and float for these. And then you would have other calculations to then try to determine if we book the venue here and then we start selling tickets, how long would it take before we had to start booking whatever it is, right? So you have these different things that you can now determine in your overall network. All right. Here again, you're going through these steps to identify the slack and the float. And you're building your networks for them. The bottom line, team, is one of the key things to start you on the path of success in doing projects, understanding the scope, being able to identify what is in, what is out. The other thing is building your work breakdown structure. That is identifying what the project is supposed to do and deliver, and then looking at all the necessary things in a decomposition to do that. Um, let's see. Hmm? I don't know. Some of them may still remember that, right? What I typically do is ask you all questions, kind of you know, stretch your mind, see how well you're doing, and uh, kind of reinvigorate you. So let's do this. A farmer sells apples for a dollar a piece. Each apple is wrapped in a special wrapper. For three wrappers, you get one additional apple. If you have $51. How many total apples can you get? Yes. A farmer sells apples for a dollar a piece. Each apple is wrapped in a special wrapper. For 
67? No. 68? No. 74? No. 75? No. 56? No. 73? No. 75? No. 74? No. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention. I will uh, see you all at another point in time. To dziękuję bardzo za uwagę i do zobaczenia innym razem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need security. Listen. <laughs>